I'm here with Phil Straub, Garland's Managing Director of Aviation, and it's an auspicious time because Garmin just won the Collier Trophy for its Autoland system. So Phil, what prompted Garmin to explore Autoland? Well, the genesis of Autoland goes back um, about 10 years. I think it was around the 2011 timeframe. And it really began as kind of a simple exploration of the different automation technologies we have around aviate, navigate, and communicate. When we look at each of those and you think about the flight control system, a fully capable digital flight control system in the aviate arena, we know we have extensive navigation capabilities and with uh, satellite-based augmentation that only gets more and more accurate. And then the communications is a combination of tr certainly traditional VHF communications, uh, some SATCOM capabilities, and then we have voice synthesis. And we looked at all those technologies and we said, hey, these are all coming together in a point that as we reflect back on some of these tragic accidents, I think we can make a difference with automation to really take over uh, command and control of the aircraft in a situation where the crew cannot do that. So what was it like the first time you experienced Autoland? It was, and I'm coming from the avenue of both an engineer and as a pilot. As an engineer, I thought, okay, this is so cool. I'm seeing all this technology converge to a point beyond the normal operational envelope of the aircraft we fly. You know, we're used to flying down to minimum use height, things like that with the flight control system. As a pilot, the strange thing was we've probably all allowed an airplane to fly beyond like the MUH decision altitude on an approach and said, well, let's see how the autopilot does it. It tracks a little bit closer. You know, even things can fly with visual acquisition of the runway environment down to 100 feet. And that's still good to maybe, you know, you rely on flight director guidance and things like that. The strange thing, though, for me as a pilot was to actually allow the automation to touch down on the runway and then to take it a step farther to derotate, let the nose down and hear the nose wheel sweep on the runway, and then one step farther, actually have the automation fly and maintain or maintain directional control on the rollout and apply braking. We're just not used to automation uh, doing that type of role in the, in the flight. So during the the whole early exploration of this product, there must have been discussions about accidents that have happened where it certainly could have made a difference. Was that a, a big factor? Yeah, I've, I've kind of been open and transparent in the fact that, you know, I've been at Garmin since 1993. I've been a pilot, private pilot. Uh, I got my private in 87. I've been flying really all my life. And so there are certain events that really made a mark on me as a pilot and as an engineer and others around me, my colleagues. And Payne Stewart was certainly one of those. And I want to say that was, I think that was October of 1999. And I relate things in my garment career and flying career where I was at that point. But I was in my late 20s, and I was working lead software engineer on the GNS 430, trying to bring that product to market. I think a lot of folks know the GNS 430. Then we came on with the 530. And when that happened, I think that just captivated well, a whole uh, country as we watch helplessly as this airplane flew along. But I think if you're a pilot, it makes you think, could that happen to me? I guarantee you every pilot out there was thinking, how would I have dealt with this emergency situation, you know, with the depressurization there? Would I have caught that? And then as an engineer, you're sparking in your head, you're thinking, huh, I wonder if I could solve that problem. And I think where we were, at least as a company or as an industry at, uh, at that point, it really wasn't where we had all the automation pieces that would come together. But you look about over the next course of a decade, these pieces, at least within Garmin, developed at a very sophisticated level with a digital automated uh, computer control of these systems. And so fast forward now to about 2011, 2010, that's where you kind of see the spark coming you know, we ought to really get serious about this. Let's start exploring. We took one of our flight test assets and equipped it. Auto throttle, came up with a braking system, and all these pieces that came together. So uh, that's kind of the background of how it evolved. And I really call it more of an evolution. It wasn't, you know, this big revolutionary thing. It really was a convergence of all these factors that drove us to do this. 
So what was the most difficult part of the development process, Phil? I think some of the interesting things were like uh, uh, the actual touchdown and rollout. And you don't always appreciate that as a pilot. You have a lot of sensory cues that you rely on. You just innately do. And for example, you let the nose wheel down and you know for an interconnected nose wheel and rudder, you know, they're doing the same thing. And as you put that down on the ground, I think we as pilots get used to knowing that we need to correct so the airplane doesn't start to veer off to the side with the nose wheel having traction on the ground. Well, the software doesn't automatically know that. You have to build in logic. And you think about it, when does the software, how does the software even know that the nose wheel actually has made contact with the surface of the runway and is starting to have an influence on the directional control of the airplane? It's little things like that that you take for granted as a pilot that you have to teach and develop algorithms in your software to handle appropriately. And I could go on with several different examples that way, but that's just, I think, an illustrative one we don't think of naturally, but was very real. So there must have been a lot of testing, though, to, to prove that it worked and also to achieve certification. Oh, yeah. We had to go out and fly. You know, if the pilot flew in the conditions, we had to do it. And so I love uh, telling the stories of, you know, like uh, there was a winter here in Kansas, right? We had snow on the runway and all that. The airport crews out doing what they love to do, which is they're supposed to do. And that's clear the, the, the runways and taxiways for, for uh, aircraft coming in. And we had asked the tower one time when we were out, said, hey, could you hold off the crew from doing this section? Of, uh, of the actually the taxiways where we we're doing some high speed uh, training of our algorithms so we could have that contaminated surface to work with. Uh, and, and that is a, an example, if it, if it wasn't clear in that, when you learn how to maintain directional control on the runway and do all this, you don't start a touchdown speed of say around 90 knots. So you start at a slow speed and you work your way up and you throw in those factors like a contaminated surface or a crosswind situation. And speaking of crosswinds, you know, we've, we've flown this thing well beyond demonstrated crosswind uh, or, uh, components in the flight manual. We've flown tailwind landings. We've flown high elevation surfaces. We've flown surfaces with uh, uneven waviness to the runways. You know, whatever type of conditions we thought could be encountered in real life, we went out, we found those conditions, and we tested thoroughly. Garmin has been uh, diligent about keeping the pilot in the loop in its avionics design, but Autoland is kind of a separate animal that if the pilot gets out of the loop, gets incapacitated, it can still salvage a situation. Uh, we really don't know the actual situation. It could be a pilot is completely um, out of the loop, you know, incapacitated. It could be, a, and I think a thing that a lot of people overlook is that medications can impair pilot aeronautical decision-making. You know, we talk a lot about aeronautical decision-making, EDM. And uh, just pick a, an example, like Benadryl, right? That common cold medicine, allergy stuff, a lot of people take. Do you know, if you go to the FA website, medication list, it says you need to wait 60 hours before flying if you've taken Benadryl. I think uh, with so many of these uh, incident, accident investigations, they find the toxicology reports that pilot has things in their system that they didn't know impaired their ability to make good sound judgments. So we have to think about this system, not only, I mean, it could be completely pilot out of the loop, but it may be an impaired pilot. It may be uh, the passengers are actively involved. So from a human factor standpoint, you had to really consider all these type of scenarios where you have partial functioning pilot, passengers, maybe everyone out, and you know, all those situations. And then the other part of human factors always said, let's think about the case where it really is a medical emergency. And let's say it's a family or even just business colleagues, whoever it is. Think about if your spouse, for example, was the pilot of this aircraft and you and your family, your children are on back. Can you imagine the stress you would be feeling at that point, not only uh, from, hey, this airplane doesn't have a pilot or may not have a pilot that can do the job, but just your loved one is experiencing this stressful, this terrible situation. So you know that people don't always react as you think they would. 
So we have to think in those ways of how could people react and interfere with the system and the automation of how we designed it. So I probably gave you a very long answer, but there's so many different um, angles you can go on to talk about, you know, that type of thing that we had to think about. Right now, Autoland is certified in three typical owner pilot aircraft, the Piper M600, the TBM 940, and the Cirrus Vision Jet. But obviously, the applicability would, would work for larger aircraft, such as the Learjet that Payne Stewart was in. Yeah. And we're going to see Autoland move up to these uh, larger aircraft? Yeah, you're going to see it go up in aircraft size, and you're going to see it go down. At least that's our goal, because we think this technology has just a critical role in saving lives. And the part about going up, sometimes people think uh, going up into larger aircraft is, is more difficult. But frankly, I think that's an easier step for us, because as we go up, say, into the light jet category uh, and beyond, those airplanes have anti-skid systems in there. They typically have emergency type braking systems that uh, could be activated, you know, through a certain set of uh, capabilities and automation that way. Uh, they may have auto throttle. They usually have radar altimeters, it's pretty standard on most uh, turbine airplanes. So when you look at building blocks that we need to pull this whole system together, because we need to, the pilot does it, we probably need to be able to automate it. And it's probably just a little bit easier in a lot of those airplanes to do that level of integration. How did the Garmin team react when they heard they won the Collier Trophy? <laughs> uh, I still grin ear to ear. You know what I tell people is, I, we, we spent about a year, right? From we, someone suggested, you guys ought to consider the Collier Trophy for this. And honestly, we had not really thought about it till about a year ago. And you said, you know, maybe we should. So then for this whole year, we've been thinking about okay, how do we kind of frame it up and present it and go through the process? But I don't think any of us really thought about we might actually win. It was more about the pursuit, the journey of getting there. And then we, when we were notified that we actually won, it was just surreal is the only thing I can say. I think it's like winning the Super Bowl or something like that to where, okay, you won it, but it takes a period of time to absorb what it means because – just incredibly humbled by these great, you know, pioneers we stand next to that won this ahead of us. So it's humbling. Uh, as I told our team, our, our names are now etched in history there, um, and we're just grateful for the recognition. Garmin is the first avionics company to to win a Collier. So even though you're in good company, this is a kind of a unique recognition, isn't it? You know, so I, I heard that. You, you mentioned that, and I never went back to really verify that. I, I take your word that technically there isn't an avionics company that's won it before. You know, I, I know Sperry uh, had been involved with some of their, I think, gyroscopic type things, and, and I think uh, Bill Lear had been involved somewhere for autopilot type things. But I guess technically speaking, an avionics company has not won it. So if that's the case, we'll... we'll uh, We'll gratefully accept that honor and, and uh, be very proud of it. And now uh, Garmin's working on other products that you can't tell me about, I'm sure. But uh, what, what kind of exciting uh, new Collier-worthy uh, developments are coming for us? <laughs> well, I don't want to get in the cart ahead of the horse there, but I think, you know, Here's how I'd say, if you want to get inside our heads and think about things a little bit, we want to make a difference, right? We want to make great value for aviation. We love aviation, right? And so look at where pilots are struggling, um, accidents, incidents, deviations from rules, things like that. Uh, we've, we want aviation to be a means of transportation available to the greater public. So how do we bring down that barrier of entry so maybe it doesn't take as much training to get there. It doesn't require much as much ongoing proficiency. Whatever ways that automation, technology, software can help with that to make it safer and more uh, accessible and increase the performance, the effectivity of these, these vehicles, you know, we're going to kind of focus on things like that. Excellent. Well, Phil, thank you very much. And congratulations to the Garmin team on the Collier Trophy win.
Well, thank you very much, Matt. On behalf of the whole Garmin team, we're just extremely grateful and thankful for that. Thanks for watching this AIN video. Please like, subscribe, and share it if you've enjoyed it. Also, visit AINonline.com for all the latest on the aviation industry.